Are you ready for the story? I'm ready for the story. On March 1981st, John Hinckley Jr. committed a horrific act by opening fire and shooting President Ronald Reagan, resulting in a severe injuries to the president and three other men, including Press Secretary James Brady, who was left permanently disabled. So Hinckley was ultimately found not guilty by reason of insanity and was confined to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. So after investigation, it revealed that he struggled with depression and psychosis, which, intensi- which was intensified by his fixation on the film Taxi Driver. He watched this film 15 times and became obsessed with this actor named Jody Foster, which led him to attempt the assassination on the president to impress the actress. <laughs> I think that's the the greatest reason for a president. Assassination. Assassination, yeah. Yeah. Today we are discussing about Robert Francois Damiens. And, you know, while the circumstances are very different in many ways, I want to talk about the gravity of the crime and the severity of the punishment. So Damiens had stabbed King Louis XV, um, leading to the trial that accused him of religious radicalism. And because of this, he endured a brutal execution, which involved the melting of his hand and the dismemberment of his limbs by horses. So this is his story. His story. This yeah. this is his story. <laughs> There's no more stories. There's just one. <laughs> Do by eleven fifty nine. Hi everyone, welcome to Do at eleven fifty nine. I'm your host Susie. And I'm Thomas. The whole co- the, the, the co- <laughs> <laughs> All sources are in the description, and we are going to be getting into very gruesome details about tortures. So if you guys are sensitive to gruesome details, I recommend not listening to this episode. But without further ado, let's get started. So Robert was born on January 9th, 1715, in Toulouse, France, which is northern France. And his dad is named, or was named, Pierre-Joseph, and he was a gatekeeper. And his mom was named Marie Guillemont. And they were both hard worker and, you know, worked hard to make ends meet. He had an older brother named Antoine Joseph and also a sister named Catherine. Growing up, Robert was known to be a troublemaker and often a wicked little guy. In 1729, Robert's mother, Sally, passed away, um, and he was about 14 years old at this time. And so his family couldn't take care of him, and so they decided to send him away to his great uncle, um, who was a grain merchant and also a cabaret, cabaret owner. So I didn't know what a cabaret was, but it's a show. It's like a concert and, and a mix of musical. Did you know what it was? Well, I know we went to a cabaret show. Really? When? Crazy Horse. Oh. Crazy Horse. Is that a cabaret? Yeah, it's like a a slightly more risky cabaret. Oh. Really? Okay. Anyways, we did. (laughs) (laughs) So Robert's uncle wanted him to go to a school and get education, but he didn't like the idea. He said that studying wasn't for him, and even with all the persuasion by his uncle, he was like, nah uh uh uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so his uncle uh-huh. sent him to a apprentice program to a local locksmith and he spent a couple of years making wigs and was also a cook but left because he also realized that this wasn't for him robert he stated that he possessed a youthful levity also known as a youthful spirit Soon after leaving the program, he enlisted in the army, and by 1734, he helped siege Philipsburg. Um, and a couple of years later, he was discharged due to an illness, fever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> discharged okay. him because he had a fever. Uh, again, it's deadly back in the days because they didn't yeah. have the right medical equipments and everything so yeah. it makes sense and then he moved on to become a household servant so he was known as robert le diable or robert the devil robert had a lot of different masters after discharging from the army he was known as robert le diable also known as robert the devil because he just he wouldn't keep his mouth shut and he had a very different perspective from other people 
that the masters are not comfortable with, and so they would often fire him, and he'll have to go to another master to work for them. By 1739 till the 40, he worked at a Jesuit college, Louis Le Grand, and he was fired due to some of the comments that he made about Jesuits. Jesuits? Uh, I think I don't know how to say uh, Jesuits, but... Oh, okay. Some suspect that he may have intentionally been fired because he wasn't allowed to live with his wife at that time working as you know a servant because oftentimes servants were living as bachelors so they would like make them live inside the place or whatever so they weren't yeah that's why he was like you know what i'm gonna get fired anyway so i can live with my wife yeah he's a gentleman he's a sweet guy growing up robert had a violent and bitter air around him that's what people would say he was a tall man he had a long face and his nose was described as a bit hooked hooked good (laughs) (laughs) it was like a little bit hooked (laughs) and his mouth was sucked in sunk in kind of like that yeah Yeah, yeah. (laughs) and his lips was always fucking blah, moving blah, blah. because blah 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 because he loved talking it just never stops in 1739 he married his wife elizabeth mullerian and he had a daughter and a son with her he was often said to be self-conceited talkative <laughs> say stuff about others that you know people wouldn't usually say and he would mutter to himself and he was described as stubborn as well now at this time robert was going through multiple masters as mentioned and you know and oftentimes he was also unemployed because some of the masters will only last a couple months and he'll have multiple months of just no masters and searching for one however on june 6 1756 he started becoming a little more erratic there were rumors that he was chasing women and he also loved wine was he like married yeah he was married at this time but again, rumors. Rumors. Yes. Okay. At this time, he also stole 240 Louis from his master, Jean Michel. Oh, and Louis is also known as Louis Dor. And Ooh. it was a gold coin that were used in France before the French Revolution. According to some of the research that I saw, 240 Louis is about 250 to 10,000 euro. Is that like back then Each, or nowadays? Like calculate to now. So in USD, it's two hundred seventy. It's between two hundred seventy one dollar and ten thousand eight hundred sixty eight dollar and twenty five cents. So that was his first time stealing, and it was alleged that it was motivated by his family's financial difficulty over inheritance back home. So after he stole the money, he fled to Saint Omer before the police could get him, and he spent the money on his brother and younger sister. He bought them gifts and also anything that they needed. The family wasn't having his crime, though. (laughs) They confronted him about what he did and asked where he got the money because it's kind of weird that he suddenly showed up with a $10,000 money. It's unheard of back then. So his family started accusing him, and he was actually kind of hurt by their accusation because he thought that they would you know, be happy that he had all this money, but instead they were accusing him. They didn't want him to steal the money and they wanted him to return it. Because of this, he went to an apothecary. Um, there are people that sell medicine and also makes them mm. and drugs as well. It's like the old version of a pharmacy. Pretty much. When he was there, he decided to buy arsenic and attempted to kill himself with that. So arsenic is a natural occurring substance, especially in the air and water, soil, all that jazz. And it can cause cancer and a lesion in the skin, but it doesn't cause, it doesn't kill someone immediately. So thankfully it didn't work, but he did fall sick after taking the arsenic. He refused to give the remainder of the money back to the owner and did not confess his, his sin to the priest. On July 16th, he was finally arrested for his crime, and he was let go soon after that. He then spent the next five months in Artois, which is also in North France, going to shows, bars, just hopping around in, and it was evident that he was tormented 
by his guilt and what he had done. A lot of, you know, people around him and the people who have seen him said that he would speak to himself, especially at night. He acted out, would continue to drink, and stayed alone in his room all the time. He was easily agitated and was angry and would lose it if people approached him. So Robert would lock himself in the cellar of the cabaret and he would cut himself and drain his blood so that the bad blood could get out. That's what he believed and that's what a lot of people believed back in the days. A lot of people suspect that this is him likely experiencing the psychotic symptoms, you know, showing yeah. up. So around late December, Robert went back to Paris and he met up with his younger brother and his wife. His wife wanted him to leave Paris because it was dangerous for him. He hasn't confessed to his sin, his sin and he it, it was still a crime at the end of the day. His wife was able to convince him after many, many persuasion, and he promised to go back to Arcois and stay hidden. On January 3rd, 1757, around 11 p.m., he said that he was going to go back to Artois, and he boarded a coach for that. But instead, he went to the Versailles. He decided to leave the remainder of the stolen money in her bag. So at around 3 a.m., he arrived in the Versailles and stayed at an inn for the night, and he had a glass of wine before falling asleep. So on January 5th, 1757, it was morning, and he asked people to, you know, blood him, or bloodletting. So this process involves withdrawing blood from a person, and oftentimes it was through leeches or cutting someone, and they believe that if they drain the blood, it would drain them from the bad sin, or the bad blood. But there was no source that said that they actually did this to Robert. Around 10 a.m. he left the inn and around 4 to 5 p.m. a guard saw him in the courtyard of the Chateau of the Versailles and at 5 45 p.m. he walked around and saw the king about to enter the coach. Immediately Robert ran towards the king, pushed the Dauphine's side and grabbed the king's left shoulder with one hand and the other stabbed the right shoulder. And this stab was exactly the fifth rib up. After he stabbed the king, Robert stepped back and looked at Louis the Fifteenth, and he was just shocked at what he did. He didn't realize what he had done. And Louis the king felt under his coat for the wound as to what just happened, and he turned to Robert and said, "This is the man who stabbed me. Arrest him, but do him no harm." So Robert didn't attempt to run away. He just stood there in shock as to what he had done. And turned out Louis the Fifteenth was slightly wounded, but he did not bleed excessively. It was just a scab. The guard dragged Robert away, and while awaiting his trial, he was fastened to his bed by leather straps, and he was guarded all day, and they switched out every four hours. During the trial, Robert's family testified and said that he had gone crazy. He was just unpredictable, and they just don't know how many masters he's had at that point. So Robert stated that he just wanted to touch the king, not kill him. I don't know if that's a good argument. I'm yeah. sorry, but that's what he said. And he, was, he stated that he wanted to ensure that there was restoring in all things in order and tranquility in his state through miracles and God. So Robert decided to use a short knife, and this is no way to puncture a deep, deep wound to the king. Again, he yeah. didn't want to kill the king. And he also explained that if he wanted to kill the king, he would have repeated the blow, but instead he only stabbed the king once. The judges asked more about the religion that he was talking about. Robert stated that when he was returning from his job, he heard a Jansenist state that if someone could hit the king, the Archbishop of Paris might be prevented from refusal of sacraments. They pretty much were not allowing, you know, the servants or those who were poor to go to prayers. Really? Yeah. So they just wouldn't let them practice? To enter sacraments. To, like, go to church. That's, that's fucked up. Yeah. Because apparently back then, servants were unholy. Jansenist was a minority that was within the Catholic Church, 
and it was popular among the working people because it appealed to humanity and also charity. And the judges saw Robert as a radical because he was likely a Jansenist, and he did have a Jansenist idea because he spent time in Palais de Justice. And so when he spent time there, he was exposed to discussions and debates about lawyers, counselors, and all this stuff. And these were ideas, inline ideas, that other people didn't really think of back then. The monarchy, the church, and the people saw Robert as a Jansenist, and Jansenists are a threat because they needed people to work for them to maintain power. Robert also stated that the king should be about justice and not listen to corrupt leaders and ministers. The king needed to fix issues such as poverty, taxed, the high cost of basic necessities like bread, and the king needed to take more actions because he is representing the people. But at this time, there was political unrest in ordinary working people. They felt unsupported by the government, and many were starved. The economy was poor. Technology was poor. Bureaucracy was corrupted. And <laughs> the bakers, I know it's so random, <laughs> but they overpriced their bread. Like, they would sell them at a very, very huge price. And many of the servants and the working people were angered, and they protested about this, about the high cost. But it's a very shitty economy. The people in power would round up beggars in Paris, especially the young ones and children, and they would send them to colonies because they wanted to clean up Paris. Wow. I didn't know about this. I didn't either. Yeah. So obviously they received many backlash for this, what they were doing. And Robert was apparently really mad about that because his daughter was allegedly one of the child that had been sent over to the colonies. So apparently Robert was sending letters that was threatening the lieutenant of the police to have her released. Now there were many riots and protests because of the unfair justice, but the authorities did not give a fuck. They executed many people who were rioting even if they had no crime and the poor were often punished more severely for small crime. Robert wanted to say that the king needed to do something, and if he was not going to use his power for good, he shouldn't be leading the country at all. Yeah. I kind of agree with him, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. But then, he was a radical, apparently. I mean, it, yeah. I guess it is a radical idea back then. The prosecutors during the trial believed that Robert was likely part of the Society of Jesus and Jansenist, or one of that. And those two were rivals within the French Roman Catholic Church. Many of them, in fact, believe that Robert was part of the Jesuits' plot against the crown, and he was an agent for the parliament. And parliament is the High Court of Justice. Yeah. And the parliament did not like Louis XV at that time, since he supported the Jansenist. But they couldn't yeah. prove that Robert was involved in the conspiracy, and during the trial, during the treacherous trial, actually, he revealed no names even after 50 interrogations. Overall, there were little to no evidence that proved that he was involved with any of the two, you know, factions. And on May 26, 1757, he was condemned as a regicide and was guilty for attempted murder. Even though, again, he only scratched the king. Yeah, and honestly, it sounds like the king didn't even really care that much for him. Yeah, he literally, the king literally stated, do him no harm. Yeah, do not, do not hurt him. Yeah. Robert was sentenced to be tortured in Place de Crive, France. I think he was just a sick man who needed help. He was confused with what he heard and he believed that what he heard was right and he acted yeah. on it. I mean, these are, you know, very different reasons than the insanity plea that we talked about earlier. But yeah. It still definitely seems like an insanity case, not a malicious yeah. intent. Considering what we went over, him muttering to himself, speaking to himself, just being yeah. like agitated easily. These He's, are all symptoms of like... He's showing all the early signs of... Yeah. Psychosis. But I don't think they believed him at all back then. No. No. This was, this was before the days of PTSD. Even. Yeah. I mean, PTSD was like... It was known as shell shock, and that yeah. was during World War Two. World War One, I think. 
one of the world wars. I, I, I think it was World War One because, yeah. like, back in the old days, you know, you went on a battlefield and you both, like, lined up yeah. and shot each other. There were yeah. no bombs. There were no... Yeah. Things like that. What's really sick about this whole trial is that men and women would pay to see him get tortured. So the courtier of the king had planned the torture and the days. They planned the exact torture out and which day to do it on. And people from England would travel to France to see Robert get tortured. So on May 28th, during the early morning, Robert was taken to the Archbishop of Paris and there was an order to recite prayers for 40 hours straight. They believed that the king represented God on earth and because Robert stabbed him, he deserved the greatest punishment because they saw that when he stabbed the king, he was stabbing God. Robert was taken to the main door of the Church of Paris. They made him strip down and he held a burning wax torch, which weighed at two pounds and he was forced to kneel and declare his sin and ask God for his forgiveness. By 7 a.m., he was brought out to the crowd. So they brought him out naked in front of the entire crowd? Yeah, they stripped him in front of the entire crowd to, I don't know, to mess with his... To uh, humiliate him? Yeah, okay. to torture him mentally. In front of Robert was a stove with smoke coming out. Inside was melting chemicals with hot coals, and it sent vapors into the air. Now, Robert was confused as he looked at the smoky pond. When the smoke entered his nose, he started coughing a couple times. So Robert's hand was bounded to a platform with his wrist exceeding the end of the platform. Robert looked at his right hand and the expression on his face was just sadness and loss. So he murmured to himself, what have I done? What did I do here? Gabriel Sanson was in charge of the torture and he walked over with the blaze and plunged Robert's hand into the boiling water and sulfur. Now, reminder, this is because he stabbed the king. So sulfur is good for us. <laughs> it, it builds and fixes DNA and the other parts of our body. And it does smell awful though. And it's found in batteries and fertilizers and other stuff like that. And sulfur will not do a lot of damage, but the extreme heat did. Now, when the melting liquid touched Robert's hand, he let out a painful cry. And once the first pain passed, he raised his head and watched his hand burn. But he couldn't do anything but grind his teeth from the pain. Now, it has only been three minutes since this torture began. So Gabriel could not do the second part of the torture. He was already struggling with melting Robert's hand. He was shaking and trembling during the whole process when he walked over to when he poured or dipped Robert's hand inside the pot. So he paid a valet. His name was Andre Legris, and he accepted to take over the job for a hundred pound. Andre approached Robert with a medal in his hand. It had a red glowing tip at the end. It was a red hot pincer and it started clamping onto Robert's arms, then thigh, then breast. With each clamp they made, they pulled on Robert's skin after, leaving a sizzling sound behind. Pretty much cooking his skin alive. After they teared his skin apart, they poured boiling oil, molten wax, and lead over the open wound and Robert's eye popped out from its socket, and his mind was just lost. He couldn't understand what it was happening to his body, and Robert let out a sinister cry and said, Again, do it again. They brought Robert down from the platform and placed him on top of a three-foot frame. Now at this time, Robert begged for them to kill him, but they did not. They asked if Robert has anything else to say. And he said no. They tied Robert up to four horses for each limb, and the crowd could see Robert squeezed his eyes shut as they did this. The priestess of St. Paul approached Robert, and she held a crucifix for him to kiss. 
She felt horrible for Robert, but there was nothing that she could do. Robert did not open his eyes, but he signaled that he heard her. Throughout this, he would occasionally scream, Jesus, Mary, to me, to me. It was as if he wanted to be taken away, begging for help, any, as long as he was away from his executioners. Now, Charles Sanson was on top. Wait. Gabriel is the uncle, uh, and Charles is the nephew. Okay. He was 18. 18? Gabriel, yeah, Charles was 18 at this time. Yeah, it's kind of wild. <laughs> People are kind of wild back then. <laughs> Charles Sanson was on top of a scaffold, and he was taller than all the men there. Charles signaled for the horses to start pulling Robert, and there was a helper which grabbed each horse brutal, the leash on the horse's face, and there was another helper that was behind the horses, ready to whip them if it was needed. So once Charles signaled for them to start pulling, the horses slowly walked outward in different direction, and the horses were trying their best to pull. Robert, and they pulled so hard that one of the horses fell onto the pavement, doing its best to obey the command. But even with so much effort, they were not able to pull the muscle apart. The horses pulled for hours, but there was no effort of a tear. And it was evident that Robert was affected even with all that pull. His arms and legs were disproportionate in length. But Robert was still alive. He was breathing hard, and he was groaning in pain. So the priest of St. Paul fainted when she saw this. Clerks hid behind their toga and the crowds were murmuring and wondering what happened. Is he still alive? Is he dead? What's going to happen next? Now Mr. Boyer was a surgeon and he informed the commissioner judges that the dismemberment would not be possible if they don't provide horses with some help. And he suggested that they need to cut the big nerve so that the horses could pull easier. So Andre grabbed an axe and he started to cut the critical tendons to Robert's legs and arms. This sent shocks into Robert's body and mind. His body shut down and turned numb and the crowd could see him thinking, is this really it? Is my body being dragged apart? Now Robert was screaming in pain when they were doing this and the horses began ripping the legs off, one after another. He continued to beg to be killed, but everyone watched. The horses then pulled his arms off until it was just his torso and his head, and Robert was still alive until his last limb was pulled apart. His eyelids raised and he looked into the sky and he took his last breath and passed away. The torture lasted four hours, and finally, they threw his head, his body, and his limb into fire. His hair was brown when everyone first saw him, but it turned white in the fire, and his ashes were scattered into the wind. Robert was 42 years old when this happened, and he didn't know his age at this time. Most people didn't know back then. Many were excited to see him tortured. Men and women disguised their smile behind their mask and excused their joy, saying that he deserved it because he attempted to kill the king. Giacomo Casanova. Giacomo Casanova. Thank you. So he was a famous Italian adventurer and also an author, and he was an attendee at that torture. He noted the whole event in his journal. And he was disgusted with the viewers who were excited about the torture and, view and revealed their sadistic nature. He mentioned that a guest at his social gathering became sexually aroused when the torture unfolded, especially when Robert was screaming in pain. The executioners were talking about just how much they could have done it more differently, just more entertaining. Why not sever some tendons? That's what Charles Sanson stated. Again, he was an 18-year-old assistant to his uncle, the executioner. And overall, this was sick and twisted how they plan out the whole torture, stating, what if we did this or that? Yeah, this. But not many people were sadistic, fortunately. Many were outraged about his execution and the method that they used. They openly supported his action, 
and the mon and the monarchy got scared, and so because the monarchy got scared, they started prosecuting more people, and attempted to scare people and quiet them, but that did not work. So apparently, the king was not in agreement with the torture or the death. He didn't want Robert to be tortured, but he was. He didn't want the torture to be prolonged, but again, it was. So apparently, the king had fell into a depression after that. But how could he let his courtiers get their way? Robert's family house was razed and demolished. His brothers and sisters were ordered were ordered to change their name, and his father, his wife, and his daughter were banished from France. Did the king order this, or did the king have no power over any of this? I don't think he did. Wow. Now, for the next twelve months. They used Robert's event as a theme for songs, poem, publications. For example, we have the tale of two cities. They stated, "Listen once again, then Jacques," said the man with the restless hand and the craving air. The name of that prisoner was Damiens, and it was all done in the open day in the open street of the city of Paris. Nothing was more noticed in the vast concourse that saw it done than the crowd of the ladies of quality and fashion, who were full of eager attention to the last. To the last, Jack, prolonged until nightfall, when he had lost two legs and an arm and still breathed. People were first condemned and blamed Robert for his action, but as time passed, they thought, "Did Robert really deserve the torture he endured? Was that really fair?" Now, Robert's story is one of the saddest. His story was removed from history. France tried to remove any records of him. And some see him as a madman. Some believe that he was part of an organized conspiracy. Some believe that he represents the spirit of time. But his story shows just how evil human society can be. They tortured him because they can, and no one was there to stop them. I think it also reflects how fear in the authorities can cause a man to be gruesomely tortured and then suffer for four hours because of their fear. I also think just human nature, especially the people traveling to come and see this. Like, yeah, well, this is a very depressing episode. I mean, I could try to lighten the mood with a joke about why we all hate the British, but <laughs> no, this is a very uh, sad story. Uh, I don't know if if I can say. I hope you guys enjoy this episode okay. because it's it's dark. <laughs> um, we, but we. We hope you enjoyed the time you spent listening to the episode. Yes, learning about a history that I never knew until reading this. Again, I hope you guys learned something new. And if there's anything else that I should look into, learn more about, that would be great. And I'll see you guys on the next episode. Bye. See you on the next one. Bye.